on my awakening for the second time, from a sleep of death, to consciousness in the spirit world, I found that I was in much more pleasant surroundings. There was daylight at last, though it was like that of a dull day without sun, yet what a blessed change, from the dismal twilight, and the dark night. I was in a neat little room, quite like an earthly one, lying upon a little bed of soft white down. Before me was a long window, looking out upon a wide stretch of hills and rolling country. There were no trees or shrubs to be seen, and hardly any flowers, except here and there, some little simple ones, like flowering weeds, yet even these were refreshing to the eyes, and there were ferns and grass clothing the ground with a carpet of green, instead of the hard bare soil of the twilight land. This region was called the land of dawn, and truly the light was as the day appears before the sun has rose to warm it. The sky was of a pale blue-gray, and white clouds that seemed to chase each other across it, and float in quiet masses on the horizon. You who think that there are no clouds and no sunshine in the spirit lands, hardly know how beautiful a thing you would shut out, unless you have spent, as I did, a long monotonous time, without seeing either of them. The room I was in, though by no means luxurious, was yet fairly comfortable in appearance, and reminded me of some cottage interior upon earth. It held all that was needed for comfort, if nothing it was specially beautiful, and it did not have that bare, prison-like look, of my former dwellings. There were a few pictures, of scenes of my earth life which had been pleasant, and the recollections they called up gave me a fresh pleasure, there were also some pictures of spirit life and oh! Joy, there was my picture mirror, and my rose, and the letter, all my treasures. I stopped my explorations to look into that mirror and see what my beloved was doing. She was asleep, and on her face was a happy smile, as if even in her dreams, she knew some good had come to me. Then I went to the window and looked out, over the country and those long rolling hills, treeless, and somewhat bare, except for their covering of grass and ferns. I looked long upon this scene, it was so like, and yet so unlike, earth, so strangely bare, and yet so peaceful. My eyes, long wearied with those lower spheres, rested in joy and peace, upon this new scene, and the thought that I had risen to a new life, filled me with an unspeakable thankfulness of heart. At last, I turned from the window, and seeing what was like a small mirror near me, I looked to see what change there might be in myself. I started back, with an exclamation of joy and surprise, was it possible? Could this be as I appeared now? I gazed, and gazed again. This is myself? Why, I was young again. I looked like a man of about thirty or thirty-five, not more certainly, and I looked at myself, and it was as I had been in my prime on earth. I had looked so old, so haggard, so miserable, in that twilight land, that I had avoided to look at myself. I had looked twenty times worse, than I could ever have looked on earth, had I lived to be a hundred years old. And now, why, I was young. I held out my hand, it was firm and fresh-looking, like my face. A closer inspection of myself pleased me still more. I was in all respects, a young man again, in my prime of vigor, yet not quite as I had been, no. There was a sadness in my look, a certain something, more in my eyes, than anywhere else that showed the suffering, through which I had passed. I knew that, never again could I feel the heedless, carefree ecstasy of youth, because never again could I go back, and be quite as I had been. The bitter past of my life rose up before me, and checked my carefree thoughts. The remorse for my past sins was with me, and still cast its shadow over, even the joy of this awakening. Never, ah! Never, can we undo all the past life of earth, so that no trace of it will cling to the risen spirit, and I have heard that even those, who have progressed far beyond what I have yet done, bear still, the scars of their past sins, and sorrows, scars that will slowly, very slowly, wear away at last, in the great ages of eternity. For me there had come joy, great joy, wonderful fulfillment of my hope, yet there clung to me, the shadow of the past, and its dark mantle clouded, even the happiness of this hour. While I yet thought about, the change which had passed over me, the door opened, and a spirit glided in, dressed, as I now was, in a long robe, of a dark blue color, with yellow borderings, and the symbol of our order on the sleeve. He had come to invite me to a banquet, which was to be given to myself, and others, who were newly arrived from the lower sphere. All is simple here, he said, even our festivals, yet, there will be the salt of friendship to season it, and the wine of love to refresh you all. Today, 
you are our honored guests, and we all wait to welcome you, as those who have fought a good fight, and gained a worthy victory. Then he took me by the hand, and led me into a long hall, with many windows, looking out upon more hills, and a great, peaceful, quiet lake. Here there were long tables spread for the banquet, and seats placed around for us all. There were about five or six hundred brothers newly arrived, like myself, and about a thousand more, who had been there for some time, and who were going about from one to another introducing themselves, and welcoming the newcomers cordially. Here and there, someone would recognize an old friend or comrade, or one who had either assisted them, or been assisted by them in the lower spheres. They were all awaiting the arrival of the presiding spirit of the order in this sphere, who was called the Grand Master. Presently, the large doors at one end of the hall, were seen to glide a part of themselves, and a procession entered. First came a most majestic, handsome spirit, in robes of that rich, blue color, one sees in the pictures of the Virgin Mary. These robes were lined with white, and bordered with yellow, while a hood, of yellow lined with white, hung from the shoulders, and on the sleeve was embroidered the symbol of the Order of Hope. Behind this man, was about a hundred or so of youths, all in white and blue robes, who had wreaths of laurel in their hands. At the upper end of the hall there was a handsome chair of state, with a white, blue and yellow canopy over it, and after saluting us all, the Grand Master seated himself in it, while the youths rang themselves in a semicircle behind him. After a short prayer of thanksgiving to Almighty God for us all he addressed us in these terms, My brethren, you who are assembled to welcome these wanderers, who are to find for a time rest and peace, sympathy and love, in our house of hope, and you are wandering brothers, whom we are all assembled to welcome and to honor as conquerors in the great battle against selfishness and sin, to you we give our heartiest greeting, and bid you acceptance, as members of our great brotherhood, these tributes of our respect and honor, which we offer and which you have fairly won, and from the increased happiness of your own lives, we bid you, stretch forth your hands in brotherly love to all the sorrowing ones whom you have left still toiling in the darkness of the earth life and in the spheres of the earth plain. And as you will yourselves know still more perfect triumphs, and nobler conquests, so you seek to give to others even more and more of the perfect love of our great brotherhood, whose highest and most glorious masters are in the heavens, and whose humblest members are still struggling sinners in the dark earth plain. In one long and unbroken chain our great order will stretch from the heavens to the earth, while this planet will support material life, and each and every one of you must forever remember that you are links of that great chain, fellow workers with the angels, brother workers with the most oppressed. I summon you now, each in your turn, to receive and to cherish as a symbol of the honor you have won, these wreaths of fadeless laurel which will crown the victor's brows, in the name of the great supreme ruler of the universe, in the name of all angels and of our brotherhood, I crown each one and dedicate you to the cause of light and hope and truth. Then at a signal we, the new arrivals, many of us almost overcome by these kindly words and this mark of honor, drew near, and, kneeling down before the Grand Master, had placed upon our heads these laurel crowns which the youths handed to the Master, and with it he crowned us with his own hands. When the last one had received his crown, such a shout of joy went up from the assembled brothers, such cheers, and then they sang a most beautiful song of praise, with so lovely a melody and such poetical words that I would, if I could reproduce it all for you. When this was over we were each led to a seat by an attendant brother and the banquet began you might wonder how such a banquet could be in the spirit world, but do you think that even on earth all of your enjoyment, at such a scene as in the food you eat, the wine you drink, and do you imagine that a spirit has no need for food of any kind? If so, you are in error. We need, and we eat food, though not so much of a material substance as yours is. There is no animal food of any sort, nor anything like it, except only on the lowest spheres of earth-bound spirits, where they enjoy, through others the satisfaction of the animal appetites that are still in the flesh. But there are in this second sphere the most delicious fruits, almost transparent to look at, which melt in your mouth as you eat them. There is wine like sparkling nectar, which does not intoxicate or create a thirst for more. There are none of those things which would gratify coarse appetites, but there are delicate cakes and a sort of light bread of such lightness, and of such wine that this banquet did consist of, and I for one must confess, I have never enjoyed anything more than the lovely fruits, which were the first I had seen in the spirit world, and which I was told, were truly the fruits of our own labors grown in the spiritual land by our own efforts to help others. After the banquet was over there was another speech, 
and a grand chorus of, thanks in which we all joined. Then we dispersed, some of us to see our friends upon earth and try to make them feel that some happy event had come to us. Many of us, alas, were being mourned, as among the lost souls who had died in sin, and it was a great grief to us that these earthly friends could not be made conscious of how great we were now in our hopes. Others of the brothers turned to converse with newly found spirit friends, while for my part I went straight to earth to tell the good news to my beloved. I found her about to attend one of those meetings for materialization, and, trembling with joy and eagerness, I followed her there, for now I knew there was no longer any reason why I should not show my face to her who had been so faithful and so patient in waiting for me, no longer would the sight of me give pain or shock her. Ah, what a happy night that was. I stood beside her all the time. I touched her again and again. I stood there, no more the dark shrouded figure hiding his face from all eyes. No. I was there in my new clothes, with my new hopes, my risen body, and the ashes of my dead past were there no more to give me such shame and sorrow of heart as I had known. And then, oh! Crowning joy to that most joyful day. I showed myself to her wondering eyes, and they gazed into my own. But she did not know me at once, she was looking for me as she had seen me last on earth, with a face of care and wrinkled brow, and the young man's face looked strange to her. Yet not quite strange, she smiled and looked with a puzzled wondering look which, if I could have held the material particles of my form together, for but a few more minutes, I must have changed to recognition. But, alas! All too soon I felt my material form melting for me like soft wax, and I had to turn and go as it faded away. But as I when I heard her say, it was so like, so very like what my dear friend must have been in youth. It was so like and yet so unlike him, I hardly know what to think. Then I went behind her and whispered in her ear, that it was I myself, and no other. And she heard my whisper and laughed and smiled, and said she had felt me, so surely it must be so. Then indeed the cup of my joy was full, then indeed was the crown of my day complete. After this there came for me a time of happiness, a season of rest and refreshment, upon which I will not dwell on, its memories are all too sacred to me, because those days were spent near her, who I loved, and I had the happiness of knowing that she was conscious of much of it, though not all, I said to her, that I had spent so much of my time on earth, that I had none to explore the wonders of that land of dawn of which I had become an inhabitant of. And now a fresh surprise awaited me. In all my wandering since my death, I had never once seen any of my relatives or the friends who had passed before me, into the spirit land. But one day when I came as usual to see my beloved, I found her full of some mysterious message she had received, and which she was to give me herself. After a little while she told me that it was from a spirit who had come to visit her, and who said he was my father, and that he wished her to give his message to me. I was so overcome when she said this that I could scarcely speak, scarcely ask what his message was. I had so loved my father upon earth, for my mother had died when I was so young that she was but a faint tender memory to me. But my father. He had been everything to me. He had, had such pride and joy in all my successes, such hopes for my future and, then, when I had made a wreck of my life, I knew that I had broken his heart. He did not long survive the crushing of all his hopes, and since his death I had only thought of him with pain and shame of heart. And now when I heard that from beyond the gates of death, he had come to my beloved and spoken to her of me, I feared, lest his words might be but a lament over his buried hopes, his degraded son, and I cried out that I could not dare to meet him, yet I longed to hear what he had said, and to know if there was a word in it of forgiveness for me his son, who had so deeply sinned. How will I tell what his words had been? How to say what I felt like to hear them? They fell upon my heart as dew upon a thirsty land, those words of his, and are far, far too precious to be given to the world, but surely the father in the parable must have welcomed back his prodigal son in some such words as these. Ah! How I cried out to my beloved when I heard those words, and how I longed to see that father again and be taken once more to his heart as when I was a boy. As I turned away I saw his spirit standing by us, just as I had seen him last in life, only with the glory of the spirit world upon him, such as no mortal eyes have ever seen. My father, so long parted from me, and then to meet him again. We had no words to greet each other with, but my father and my son, but we clasped each other to the heart in a joy that required no words. When our feelings had calmed down again, we began to speak of many things, and not least of her whose love had led me so far upon my upward path, 
and then I learned that this beloved father had helped, watched over, and protected us both, that he had followed me during all my wanderings, both on earth and in the spirit land, and had protected and comforted me in my struggles. Himself unseen, he had still been near, and unceasing in his efforts and his love. All this time when I had shrunk from the thought of meeting him, he had been there, only waiting for an opportunity to make himself known, and he had come at last through her, who had so much of my love, in order that he might, in this way link us all three more closely together in the joy of this reunion. When I returned to the spirit land, my father went with me and we spent a long time together. In the course of our conversation he told me that an expedition was about to be sent from this sphere to work as rescuers in the lowest sphere of all, a sphere below any I had yet seen, and which was in truth the hell believed in by the church. How long the expedition would be absent was not known, but a certain work had to be accomplished, and like an invading army we would remain until we had attained our objective. My eastern guide advised me to join this band of workers, and as my father had an earth life sent his sons forth to fight for their beloved country, so did he now wish me to go forth with this army of soldiers in the cause of truth and light and hope. To fight successfully against these powers of evil, it was necessary to be beyond the temptations of the earth plane and lower spheres, and to help the unhappy ones by a visible help which they could see and take hold of. One must not belong to the higher spheres, because spirits more advanced than the brothers of hope is in there, the first circle of the second sphere, would be quite invisible to the unhappy ones who could neither see nor hear them. Also in entering these lowest spheres, in order to be visible, we would have to clothe ourselves in a certain portion of their material elements, and this, a more advanced spirit could not do. So that although unseen helpers from the higher spheres would accompany the expedition to protect and assist us, they would be invisible like ourselves and those we had come to help. Those who were to go upon this expedition with me were similar to myself in disposition, and it was felt that we would all learn much from seeing what our passionate feelings would have sunk to, had we indulged in them. At the same time we would be able to rescue, many poor repentant souls from those dark spheres. Those whom we rescued would be taken to where I had been on my first passing over from earth life, where there were numerous institutions specially set apart for such poor spirits, presided over and attended by spirits who had themselves been rescued from the kingdoms of hell and who were therefore best fitted to aid these poor wanderers. Besides the brothers of hope from the land of dawn, there were other similar bands from other brotherhoods, always being sent down to the dark spheres, such expeditions being, in fact, part of the great system of help for sinners, forever being carried on in the name of the Eternal Father of all, who dooms none of His children to an eternity of misery. A number of friends would accompany us on a part of our journey, and our expedition would be commanded by a leader who had himself been rescued from the dark spheres and who knew their special dangers. As we would pass through the earth plane and lower spheres, we would see them in a way we had not done before, and my eastern guide said he would send one of his pupils to accompany me as far as the lowest sphere, in order that he might explain to me, and make visible some of the mysteries of the astral plane which we would see as we passed. Hussain, as the student was named, was studying those mysteries of nature, which have been classed under the name of magic, and as such deemed evil, whereas it is their abuse only that is evil. A more extended intelligent knowledge of them would tend to prevent many existing evils and counteract some of those evil powers, brought to bear upon man, often very injuriously, in his present ignorance. This student spirit had been a Persian and a follower of Zoroaster in his earth life, as Aranzaman himself had been, and they belong still to that school of thought of which Zoroaster was the great exponent. In the spirit world, said Aranzaman, there are a great number of different schools of thought, all containing the great fundamental eternal truths of nature, but each differing in many minor details, and also as to how these great truths should be applied for the advancement of the soul, they likewise differ as to how their respective theories will work out, and the conclusions to be drawn, from the undoubted knowledge they possess, when it is applied to subjects upon which they have no certain knowledge, and which are still with them as with those on earth, is the subject of speculation, theory, and discussion. It is a mistake to suppose that in the spirit world of our planet there is any absolute knowledge which can explain all the great mysteries of creation, the why and the where of our being, the existence of so much evil mixed with the good, or the nature of the soul and how it comes from God. The waves of truth are continually flowing from the great thought centers of the universe, and are transmitted to earth through chains of spirit intelligences, but each spirit can only transmit such portions of truth as his development has enabled him to understand, 
and each mortal can only receive as much knowledge as his intellectual faculties are able to comprehend and understand. Neither spirits nor mortals can know everything, and spirits can only give you, what are the teachings that their own particular schools of thought and advanced teachers give as their explanations. Beyond this they cannot go very far beyond this, they themselves do not know. There is no more absolute certainty in the spirit world than on earth, and those who assert, that they have the true and the only explanation of these great mysteries are giving you, merely what they have been taught by more advanced spirits, who, with all due deferences to them, they are no more entitled to speak absolutely than the most advanced teachers of some other school. I assert, with knowledge not my own, but from another who is indeed regarded in the spirit world as a leader of most advanced thought, that it is in no way possible to give a final answer to, or an explanation of subjects that are beyond the powers of any spirit of our entire solar system to solve, and still more beyond those of the spirits of our earth spheres. In these subjects and their explanation, are involved and required a knowledge of the limits of the universe itself, which has no limits, and the nature of that supreme being of whom no man or spirit can know the nature of, except in so far as we can grasp the great truth, that he is an infinite spirit, limitless in all senses, unknowable and unknown. Let men and spirits argue or explain, they can only teach you to the limits of their own knowledge, and beyond that again are limits none can reach. How can any pretend to show you the ultimate end of that which has no end, or sound the great depths of an infinite thought that has no bottom? Thought is as eternal as life, and as fathomless as spirit is infinite and all-pervading. God is in all and over and above all, yet none know his nature nor what manner of essence he is of, except that he is in everything and everywhere. The mind of man must pause on the very threshold of his inquiries, appalled by the sense of his own littleness, and the most he can do is to humbly learn and study cautiously, so that each step be assured before he says again to climb. The most lofty, the most daring minds, cannot grasp all at once, and can man on earth hope that all can be explained to him with his limited range of vision when the most advanced minds in the spirit world are ever being checked in their explorations for truth by the sense of their limited powers. The friend whom R. Inzaman sent to accompany and instruct me, appeared to my eyes as a youth of about 25 to 35 years of age, judging by earth's standard in such matters, but he told me he had lived to upwards of 60 years on earth. His present appearance was that of his spiritual development, which alone constitutes the age of a spirit. As a spirit grows more highly developed in his spiritual powers, the appearance becomes more matured, until at last he assumes that of a sage, without, the wrinkles and defects of age in earth life, only its dignity, its power, and its experience. Then, when a spirit has attained to the highest possible development of the earth's spheres, he would possess the appearance of one of its patriarchs, and would then pass into the higher and more extended spheres of the solar system of that planet beginning there as a youth again since his development compared to that of the advanced spirits of those higher spheres, would be but that of a youth. Hussain told me that he was at present studying the various powers and forms of nature in those stages which were below soul life, and would be able to make visible and explain to me many curious things we should see upon our journey. Many spirits, he said, pass through the sphere of the astral plane without being conscious of its spectral inhabitants by reason of the fact that their senses are not developed in such a way as to enable them to become conscious of their surroundings in all their entirety, just as in earth life there are many persons quite unable to see the spirits around them, although to others they are perfectly visible. There are upon earth persons who can see not only the spirits of human beings, but also these astral and elementary beings who are not truly spirits, since that word should be used to denote only those who possess within them the soul germ. Now many of these beings which we will see never possessed any soul, and others again are only the empty shells from which the soul germ has departed. To distinguish between the soul spirit and the soulless astral, one must possess a double power of soul sight or clairvoyance as it is termed, and many who possess only an imperfect degree of this double power will be able to see elementals and astrals, but without being able to distinguish them clearly from the soul enveloping spirit forms. Here is much confusion and where many mistakes and have arisen amongst these imperfect clairvoyants, as to the nature and attributes of these classes of beings. There are seven degrees of the soul sight found in persons, yet in the earth life, and in the next stage of life, the spiritual part, being freed from the gross elements of material life, there will be found seven more expansions of this gift, and so on in progressive succession as the soul casts off, one by one the envelopes of matter, first the most gross or earthly matter, then succeeding degrees of refined matter, 
because we believe that there can be no such thing as entire severance between soul and matter, that is, so long as it is conscious of existence in any of our solar systems. Beyond these limits we have no knowledge to guide us, and it is a matter of pure speculation. It is only a question of the degree and quality of the matter which is more or less refined and ether realized as the soul is in a higher or lower state of development. It is of the first stage of earthly conscious soul life that I will now speak about in speaking of the clairvoyant sight, leaving until another time the theories and beliefs involved in the study of what has passed before man's present conscious stage of existence, and what may happen when he passes beyond the limits of our present knowledge. We find, in the earthly stage of life, persons most often women or very young boys, who are endowed with some or all of these seven degrees of soul sight. The first three degrees are very often found, the fourth and fifth more rarely, while the sixth and seventh are hardly ever met with acceptance in persons endowed with certain peculiarities of organization, due to those astrological influences under which they are born, particularly to those prevailing at the exact moment the child sees the light of earth life. So rare are these perfect sixth and seventh degrees, that very few possess them, though some are found with an imperfect sixth, and none of the seventh, in which case they can never attain to the perfection of soul sight, and as with imperfect glasses, the defect in their sight will cause them to have an imperfect vision of celestial things, and although they will see into the sixth sphere in a sense, yet their defective power will greatly impair the value of what they see. Those who have the perfect sixth and seventh degrees, can be taken in spirit, into the seventh sphere itself, which is the highest, or heaven of the earth spheres, and like St. John of old they will see unspeakable things. To do this the soul is required to be freed from all ties to the material body, except for only the slender thread, without which there is no connecting link, body and soul would part forever. Then they may be said to be out of the body at such times, and so difficult and dangerous it is to then take the soul into the seventh sphere, that only with exceptional persons and under very exceptional circumstances can it be done, even where the power exists. Of the clairvoyance of the lower degrees of power the same may be said, except that the less celestial their powers are, the more safely and easily they may be used, each clairvoyant being able to see into that sphere which corresponds to the degree of power that they possess. It is a curious fact that many clairvoyants possess one or more perfect degrees of soul sight, and at the same time an imperfect form of a degree still higher, and when this happens, it will be found that the medium mixes the visions seen, and is not reliable, since the defective degree, if used, will act like a defective eye and causes what is looked at by both eyes at the same time, to see its imperfections. It is, therefore, far better to have the entire absence of a degree, than to possess an imperfect form of it, since the imperfect one only causes confusion in using the perfect ones, unless you do with these powers as you might do with the defective eye, and close it all together in order that the vision, though limited, may be correct. The ancients, when they found the highest amount of perfect vision of one or more degrees in their pupils, stopped their further development at that degree, before the imperfect sight of a higher one could, in any way impair the value of those that they possessed. In this way they were able to train many who, by a further effort at development, would have lost far more than they could gain, as reliable clairvoyance of moderate powers. In the old days, seers were divided into classes, even as they still are among certain schools of prophets in the East, though now the art is not studied to the perfection it once was when the Eastern nations were a power upon earth. Each class underwent a special training, adapted to their special degrees of power and class of gifts, and there was not the present curious mixture of great gifts, and entire ignorance of how to use them wisely, which in many instances results in so many inaccuracies, and so much harm, to both the mediums, and to those who go to them for spiritual knowledge. As well might a trainer of young gymnasts think, that he could overtax and strain the growing muscles without lasting harm to them, as those who make an ignorant, unlimited, and indiscriminate use and development of the mediumistic powers. A young fledgling cast from the nest too soon flutters and falls to the ground, while, if left until the wings are strong enough to bear its flight it will soar to heaven itself. With more extended knowledge on earth, there will be given to certain sensitives endowed with the needful mediumistic powers, the knowledge by which, under the guidance of those higher intelligences who are directing the great spiritual movement, they can judge between the spirits of low and degraded states, and of those of a higher degree of advancement, and then much of the confusion and danger that still hampers the movement will gradually be eliminated from it. On the spirit side of life are many teachers, who for centuries have made a study of these subjects of all forms of life, 
and of the mediumistic powers of those who are incarnated upon earth, and they are even now, seeking on all sides for open doors, through which to impart such knowledge, as may be of use to man, much that they know could not yet be imparted, but there are things that could, and with this subject as with all others, the minds on earth will expand and develop as knowledge is given. I thanked my new friend for his information and promised help, and as the expedition was soon to start, I went to earth to bid adieu for a time to my beloved. Upon our parting I will not dwell, nor say how much we both felt we would miss our constant little interactions, for even restricted as it was, by the barrier between us, it had been a great joy to both of us. I found on my return that the preparations for our journey were now complete, and I was summoned to bid my father, adieu and others, and to join my companions in the great hall where they were now assembled to receive the farewell benediction of our grandmaster. After this our band started amidst the cheers and good wishes of all the assembled brotherhood. I can hardly give you a better idea of the course of our journey than by asking you to imagine a vast spiral or corkscrew winding upwards and downwards in circling rings. A tiny speck no bigger than a pin's head in the middle of a large cartwheel might represent the earth in the center of these circling rings, an equal number of which are above and below the earth, all winding in a connected series from the lowest to the highest around this speck, and the head of the spiral pointing towards our central sun, this being regarded as the highest point of the most advanced sphere. This will give you a faint idea of the earth and its attended spirit spheres, and help you to understand how in our journey we passed from the second into the lowest sphere, and in doing so, passed through the earth plane. As we entered it I perceived many spirits of mortals hurrying to and fro, just as I had been wanting to see them, but now for the first time, I also saw, that mingling with them were many floating spectral shapes, similar to those wraiths I had seen haunting the spirit in the icy cage, in the frozen land. These wraiths seemed to be floating to and fro like driftweed upon a seashore, borne here and there by the different astral currents which revolve and circle around the earth. Some were very distinct and lifelike, until a closer inspection revealed to me, that the light of intelligence was wanting in their eyes and expressions, and there was a helpless collapsed look about them, like wax dolls from which the stuffing has run out. For the life of me I can think of nothing that will so well express their appearance. In my former wanderings through the earth plane, I had not been conscious of any of these beings, and on asking Hussein the reason of this he answered, first, because you were so much absorbed in your work, and secondly, your powers of sight were not sufficiently developed. Now look, he added, pointing to a strange little group of beings like elves, which were approaching us, hand in hand, gambling like children. Look at those, they are the mental and bodily emanations cast off from the minds and bodies of children, which consolidate into these odd, harmless little elementals when brought into contact with any of the great life currents that circle around the earth, and which bear upon their waves the living emanations cast off from men, women and children. These curious little beings have no real separate intelligent life such as a soul would give, and they are so evaporating and ethereal, that they take their shapes and change them as you will observe, like the clouds on a summer sky. See how they are all dissolving and forming again afresh. As I looked I saw the whole little cloud of figures shift into a new form of grotesque likeness, and where they had looked like tiny fairies in caps and gowns made from flowers, they now took wings, becoming like a species of half butterflies, half imps, with human bodies, animals' heads, and butterflies' wings. Then as a fresh strong wave of magnetism swept over them, lo! They were all broken up and carried away to form fresh groups elsewhere with other particles. I was so astonished at this, the real living appearance and the unreal disappearance, that I suppose Hussein read my puzzled state of mind, for he said, What you have now seen is only an ethereal form of elemental life, which is not material enough for a long continued existence on the earth plane, and is like the foam of the sea thrown up by the wave motions of pure earthly lives and thoughts. See now how much stronger on the astral plane, can be the consistency of that which is not pure. I saw approaching us a great mass of aerial forms, dark, misshapen, human, yet inhuman, in appearance. He said, These are the beings which haunt the delirium of the drunkard, which gather around him, drawn by his corrupted magnetism, and unable to be repelled by one who has lost the will power needed to protect himself from such creatures, which cling like barnacles to him, and like leeches suck his animal vitality with a strange ghoulish intelligence, like that of some noisome plant which has fastened itself upon a tree. For such a one as the unfortunate drunkard, the best help which can be given to him, is by obtaining someone upon the earth's side of life, 
who possess a strong will and mesmeric powers, and let him place the drunkard under the protection of his will and the strong influence of his magnetism, until the last of these phantoms drop off, from the inability to hold on any longer under the stream of healthy magnetism poured upon them, and the unlucky man on whom they have fastened to, the healthy magnetism acts like a poison on these creatures, and kills them so that they drop off, and their bodies are unable to hold together, then they decay into immaterial dust. Should these beings, not encounter such a strong dose of healthy magnetism, they will go on for years floating about and drawing away the animal vitality of one human being after another, until at last they become endowed with a certain amount of independent animal life of their own. At this stage they can be used by higher, more intelligent beings to carry out such work as their peculiar organizations fit them for, and it is these soulless creatures, though created and earth-nourished, whom a certain class of practitioners of the so-called black magic made use of in some of their experiments, as well as for carrying out their evil designs against anyone who had offended them. But like deadly weeds at the bottom of a dark pool, these astrals draw down and destroy in their soulless clutches, those who venture to meddle with them unprotected by the higher powers, I said friend Hussein, now tell me if these astrals, when they fasten upon a drunkard, can or do influence him to drink more, as is the case with the earth-bound spirit of a departed drunkard controls one still in the flesh. No. These beings do not derive any pleasure from the drink a man swallows, except in so far as by corrupting his magnetism, it makes him such that they can more readily feed upon him. It is his animal or earthly life force they desire. It means existence for them and is much the same as water to a plant, and beyond the fact that by draining the victim of his vitality, they cause a sense of exhaustion which makes him fly to stimulants for relief, they do not affect the question of his continuing to drink. They are mere parasites, and possess no intelligence of their own, except of so rudimentary a character that we can scarcely give it that name. To originate a thought or to impress your thoughts upon another, requires the possession of an intelligent soul germ or spark of the divine essence, and once this has been given, the being becomes possessed of an independent individuality it can never again lose. It may cast off body after body, or it may sink into grosser and still grosser forms of matter, but once endowed with soul life it can never cease to exist, and in existing, must retain the individuality of its nature and the responsibility of its actions. This is like a true human soul and the intelligent soul principle as manifested in the animals or lower types of soul existence. Whenever you see the power to reason and to act upon such reasoning manifested, either in man, the highest type, or in animals, the lower type, you may know that a soul exists, and it is only a question of degree of purity of soul essence. We see in man and in the brute creation like a power of reasoning intelligence differing only in degree, and from this fact the school of thought to which I belong draws the conclusion that both alike have a conscious individual immortality, differing, in the type and degree of soul essence, animals as well as men having an immortal future for development before them. What are the limits of the action of this law we cannot pretend to say, but we draw our conclusions from the existence in the spirit world of animals as well as men, who alike, have lived on earth, and both of whom are found in a more advanced state of development than they were in, in their earth existences. It is impossible for the soulless parasite to influence the mind of any mortal, and it is therefore undoubtedly the souls which have been incarnated in earthly bodies, and have so indulged their lower passions in that state that they are not able to free themselves from the shackles off their astral bodies, that haunt the earth and incite those yet in the flesh to indulgence in drink and similar vices. They, as you know, can control man in many ways, either partially or completely, and the most common way is for the spirit to partly envelop the man he controls, with his spirit body until a link has been formed between them, somewhat after the nature of uniting some twin children who possess distinct bodies, but are so joined to each other and interblended that all that one feels is felt by the other. In this fashion what is swallowed by the mortal is enjoyed by the spirit who controls the unfortunate man, and who urges him to drink as much as possible and when he can no longer do so the spirit will then try to free himself and go elsewhere in search of some other weak-willed man or woman of depraved tastes. Not always, can either the spirit or the mortal free themselves from the strange link woven between them by the indulgence of their joint desires. After a long continued connection of this sort it becomes very difficult for them to separate, and the spirit and the man may go on for years sick of each other yet unable to break the tie without help from the higher powers, who are always ready to assist those who call upon their aid. Should a spirit continue to control men for the purpose of self-gratification, as I have described, 
he sinks lower and lower, and drags his victims down with him into the depths of hell itself, from which they will both have a bitter and weary task to climb out of when at last the desire for better things will awaken. To a soul alone belongs the power to think and to will, and those other soulless creatures only obey the laws of attraction and repulsion, which are felt likewise by all the material atoms of which the universe is composed of, and even when these astral parasites have, by long feeding upon the vital force of men or women, attained to a certain amount of independent life, they have no intelligence to direct their own or others' movements, they float about like fever germs generated in a foul atmosphere, attracted to one person more readily than to another, and like such germs may be said to possess a very low form of life. Another class of elemental astrals are those of the earth, air, fire, and water, whose bodies are formed from the material life germs in each element. Some are in appearance like the gnomes and elves who are said to inhabit mines and mountain caverns which have never been exposed to the light of day. Such, too, are the fairies whom men have seen in lonely and secluded places amongst primitive races of men. Such as with the variations caused by the different natures of the elements from which they are formed, are the water sprites and the mermaids of ancient fable, and the spirits of the fire and the spirits of the air. All these beings possess life, but as yet no souls, for their lives are drawn from and sustained by the lives of earthly men and women, and they are but reflections of the men among whom they live in. Some of these beings are of a very low order of life, almost like the higher orders of plants, except that they possess an independent power of motion. Others are very lively and full of grotesque unmeaning tricks, with the power of very rapid flight from place to place. Some are perfectly harmless, while others again are more malignant in their instincts as the human beings from whom their life is drawn from are of a more savage race. These curious earth elementals cannot exist long amongst nations where the more intellectual stage of development has been reached, because then the life germs thrown off by man contain too little of the lower or animal life to sustain them, and they die and their bodies decay into the atmosphere. Then as nations advance and grow more spiritual, these lower forms of life die out from the astral plane of that earth's sphere, and succeeding generations begin, at first to doubt and then to deny, that they ever had an existence. Only among those ancient religions of the East, who have kept the threads of record still unbroken, there are to be found accounts of these intermediate dependent races of beings and the causes of their existence. These soulless elementals of earth, air, fire and water, are a class distinct from those others which I have drawn you as emanating from the debased intelligence of man's mind and the evil actions of his body. Look now, oh! Man of a Western nation, the knowledge which your philosophers and learned men have shut out and locked away as being harmful fables, until man, shut into the narrow bounds of what he can, with his physical senses alone see, hear, and feel, has begun to doubt, if he has any soul at all, any higher, purer, nobler self than is sustained by the sordid life of earth. See now the multitudes of beings that surround man on every side, and ask yourself if it would not be well that he should have the knowledge that could help to keep him safe from the many pitfalls over which he walks in blind ignorance and unconsciousness of his danger. In the primitive ages of the earth, man was content to look like a child for help and plead to his heavenly father, and God to send his angels and ministering spirits to protect his earthly children. In these latter ages, Man like a full-grown troublesome youth, seeks in his self-conceit, no higher help than his own, and rushes into danger with his eyes bandaged by his pride and ignorance. He scoffs at those things that he is too limited in his powers to understand, and turns aside from those who would instruct him. Because he cannot see his soul, cannot weigh it and analyze it, he says, for comfort, that man has no soul and had better enjoy this earthly life as one who will some day die and turn to dust again, consciousness, individuality, all forever blotted out. Or, again, in abject fear of the unknown fate before him, man takes refuge in the vague superstitions, the shadowy creeds of those who profess to act as guides upon the pathway to the unknown land, with little more certain knowledge than man has himself. Then, it is in pity to his wandering, struggling children that God has in these later days opened once more and wider than ever before the doors of communion between the two worlds. He is sending out again, messengers to warn man, ambassadors, to tell him of the better way, the truer path to the happiness of a higher life, and to show him that knowledge and that power, which will be, by right his inheritance. As the prophets of old spoke, so speak these messages now, and if they speak with clearer voice, with less veiled metaphor, it is because man is no longer in his infancy, 
and now needs that he should be shown the reason and the science upon which his beliefs and hopes must be founded. Listen, then, to this voice that calls, O oh, ye toilers of the earth, cried Hussein, turning and stretching out his hands towards a small dark ball that seemed to float far away on the horizon of our sight a small dark globe that we knew to be the sorrowful planet called earth. Listen to the voices that call to you, and turn not a deaf ear, and realize that it is not too late, that God is a God of the dead and of the living, because all things are alive forevermore. Life is everywhere and in everything, even the dull earth and the hard rocks are composed of living germs, each living according to its own degree. The very air we breathe and the boundless ether of universal space are full of life, and there is not one thought we think that lives for good or evil, not one act whose image will not live to torture or to solace the soul in the days of its release from its incarnation in an earthly form. Life is in all things, and God is the central life of all. Hussein paused, then in a calmer voice he said to me, Look yonder. What would you say those things were? He pointed to what seemed to me at first a mass of spirit forms which came sweeping towards us as though blown by a strong wind. As they came near I saw they were evidently soulless astral bodies, but unlike those floating wraiths I had seen haunting the man in the icy cage, these were solid, and to my spiritual sight lifelike and full of animal vigor, yet they were like automatons and did not seem to possess any intelligence. They were drifting and bobbing about like markers at sea to which boats are anchored. As they drifted close to us, my friend put forth his will force and captured one, which remained floating in mid-air. He said now look, you will observe that this is somewhat like a great living doll. It is the result of countless little living germs, that man is continually throwing off from his earthly body, emanations solely of his animal or lower life, material enough that when brought into contact with the magnetic forces of the astral plane, to form into these imitations of earthly men and women, and immaterial enough to be invisible to man's purely material sight, although a very small degree of clairvoyant power would enable him to see them. A stronger and higher degree of clairvoyant power would enable him to see, as you do, that this is not a true spirit body, since the soul principle is wanting, and a yet higher degree of clairvoyant power would show, that a soul has never been in this form, and that it has never had a conscious existence as a soul's astral body. Amongst ordinary clairvoyants the subject of astral spirits is not studied sufficiently enough to develop these degrees of soul sight, therefore few clairvoyants in your earthly country could tell you whether this was a true soul enveloping astral form or one from which the soul had departed, or yet again, one in which the soul had never been present in at all. Presently I will show you an experiment with this astral form, but first observe that being such as it is, it is fresh and full of the animal life of the earth plane, and has not the collapsed appearance of those you saw before, which had once contained a soul and which were there in a state of rapid decay still. And mark this carefully, this fresh-looking astral will decay far faster than the others, because it is none of the higher principle of life clinging to it as in the case of an astral that has once contained a soul, often remains for a long time animating and keeping it from perfect decay. Astral forms must draw their life from a higher source, from soul germs in fact, or they soon cease to exist and crumble away. But, I asked, how do they assume the shapes of men and women? By the action of the spiritualized magnetic currents that flow through all the ether space continually, as the currents flow in the ocean. These magnetic life currents are of a more ether-realized degree than those known to scientific mortals, being in fact their spiritual counterpart, and as such they act upon these cloud masses of human atoms, in the same way that electricity acts upon the freezing moisture upon a window pane, forming them into the resemblance of men and women, as the electricity forms the freezing moisture into a likeness of trees, plants, etc. It is an acknowledged fact that electricity is an active agent in the formation of the shapes of leaves and trees, etc., in vegetable life, but few know that this refined form of magnetism has a similar share in the formation of human forms and animal life. I say animal life is applied to those types which are lower than man. Then are there astral forms of animals also? Certainly, and some of them are very queer, grotesque combinations. I cannot show them to you now, because your powers of sight are not yet fully developed, and also because we are traveling too rapidly to enable me to develop them for you but some day I will show you these, as well as many other curious things relating to the astral plane. I tell you that atoms may be classed under different heads, and that each class will have a special attraction for others of its own kind, so vegetable atoms will be attracted together to form astral trees and plants, while animal atoms will form into the resemblance of beasts, birds, etc., 
and human atoms into men and women's forms. In some cases, where the human beings from whom the atoms come from are very low on the scale of humanity and nearly akin to animals, their atoms will blend with those of the lower forms of life and create grotesque horrible creatures which resemble at once animals and men, and having been seen by clairvoyance in a semi-trance condition are described as nightmare visions. In the earth spheres an immense amount of these living atoms are thrown off continually from man's lower or animal life, and these sustain and renew the astral forms, but if we were to transport one of these shells to a planet whose spheres had been spiritualized beyond the stage of material life, or in other words freed from all these lower germs, the astrals could not exist, they would become like a noxious vapor and be blown away. These astral beings, as I have said, created from the cloud masses of human atoms, and never having been in the body of any soul, are very little more permanent in their nature than the frost flowers on a window pane, unless the power of some higher intelligence acts upon them, to intensify their vitality and prolong their existence. They are, as you will see, expressionless and like wax dolls in appearance, and readily lend themselves to receive any individuality stamped upon them, here is their use in ancient times by magicians and others. Astral atoms, whether of trees, plants, animals, or human beings, must not be confused with the true spirit or soul clothing atoms which constitute the real spirit world and its inhabitants. Astrals of every kind are the intermediate degree of materiality between the gross matter of earth and the more ether realized matter of the spirit world, we talk of a soul clothed in its astral body to express that earth-bound condition in which it is too refined or immaterial for earth existence, and too grossly clad to ascend into the spirit world of the higher spheres, or to descend to those of the lower spheres. Then you mean that a spirit, even in the lowest sphere is more spiritualized, as regarding its body than an earth-bound spirit? Certainly I do. The astral plane extends like a belt around each planet and is, as I said, formed of the matter which is too fine for reabsorption by the planet, and too coarse to escape from the attraction of the planet's mass, and pass into the spheres of the spirit world to form either matter in the course of disintegration or change from one form to another and it is only the vitalizing power of such soul magnetism as it retains which enables it to cling together in any shape at all. In the case of human astral forms that have possessed individualized life as a soul's body, the astral atoms have absorbed a greater or less degree of the soul's magnetism, or true life essence, according to the earthly existence of the soul that has been good or evil, elevated or degraded, and this soul magnetism animates it for a longer or shorter period, and forms a link between it and the soul which has animated it. In the case of a soul whose desires are all for higher things, the link is soon severed and the astral body soon decays, while with a soul of evil desires, the time may last for centuries and chain the soul to earth, making it in fact earth-bound. In some cases the astral of a soul of very evil life will have absorbed the lower or higher spheres. Astral matter is practically so much of the soul's vitality, that after the soul itself has sunk into the lowest sphere of all, the empty shell will still float about the earth like a fading image of its departed owner. Such are sometimes seen by clairvoyants hanging about the places where they once lived, and are truly spooks. They have no intelligence of their own, since the soul has fled, and they can neither influence mediums nor move tables, nor do any other thing except as mechanical agents of some higher intelligence, whether that intelligence be good or evil. The astral before us now has no soul magnetism in it, it never possessed any, therefore it will soon decay and its atoms be absorbed by others. But see to what use it can be turned into when acted upon by my will power and animated for the time being by my individuality. I looked as he spoke and saw the astral doll become suddenly animated and intelligent, and then glide to one of the brotherhood whom Hussein had selected and touch him upon the shoulder, seeming to say, Friend, Hussein Bey salutes you. Then bowing to the amused and wondering brother, it glided back to us as though Hussein had held it by a string like a performing monkey. Now you see, he said, how if I chose I might use this astral as a messenger to execute some work I wished done at a distance from myself, and you will understand one of the means made use of by the old magicians to carry out some work at a great distance from themselves and without their appearing to take any share in it. These astrals are only capable of being made use of upon the astral plane. They could not move any material object, although they would be visible to material sight at the will of the mortal using them. There are other astrals, more material in substance, who could be used to penetrate into the earth itself and to bring forth its hidden treasures, the precious metals and the gems deeply buried from the eyes of men.
It would not be lawful or right for me to explain to you the power by which this could be done, and those magicians who have discovered and made use of such powers have sooner or later fallen victims to those powers they could summon to their aid but rarely continue to control it. Then I said, were this astral to become animated by an evil intelligence it would be an actual danger to man? Yes, without a doubt it might, and you will also observe, that although I should not care to descend to clothe myself in this astral form, yet a spirit more ignorant than myself could easily do so in order to make himself felt and seen upon the earth in a more palpable form than possible to any spirit who has left the earth plane, but in doing so he would run a danger of creating a link between himself and the astral body, not easily broken, and that might then tie him to the astral plane for a considerable time. You will, therefore, see how the idea has arisen that men on earth, in seeking to see their departed friends, draw the spirits back into earthly conditions and do them harm. Many an ignorant spirit who is good and pure himself, has committed the mistake of reclothing himself in one of these fresh astral shells, when he would have turned away from those that he knew to have been left by another spirit, and has found, to his cost that he has thereby made of himself a prisoner upon the earth plane, until a higher intelligence comes to his aid and releases him. In a like manner spirits of a low type can clothe themselves in these empty astral garments, but in their case the very grossness of the spirit prevents them from retaining possession long, the dense magnetism of the low spirit's own body acting as a strong noxious vapor or gas would do upon a covering made, say, of a spider's web of fine gossamer, and riping it into a thousand pieces. To a spirit above the astral plane an astral body appears almost as solid as iron, but to one below it, these fragile shells are like a cloud or vapor. The lower the soul the stronger its body is and the more firmly it can hold the soul, limiting its powers and preventing it from rising into a more advanced sphere. You mean, then, that spirits sometimes use these astral shells as they do earthly mediums, and either control them independently or actually enter into the form? Yes, certainly. A spirit above the earth plane, anxious to show himself to a clairvoyant of the lowest or first degree of power, will sometimes enter one of these shells which he at once stamps with his identity, and in that way the clairvoyant will truly see and describe him. The danger lies in the fact that when the good spirit of limited knowledge seeks to leave again the astral shell, he finds he cannot do so, he has animated it and its strong life holds him prisoner, and it is often difficult to release him. In similar manner the too complete, too long continued control of an earthly medium by a spirit, has been found to create a link between them which becomes at last a chain. To a spirit of the lowest spheres, an astral body is but a convenient, all too evaporating cloak with which to hide his own degraded spirit body, and then impose upon clairvoyance, unable to see the vile spirit underneath, but to a good and pure spirit the astral body is as a suit of iron capable of imprisoning him. Then in the case of what are called personifications by one spirit of another at seances upon earth, are these astrals made use of? Very often they are, where the mischief-making spirit is of too low a type himself to come into direct contact with the medium. You must know, that by this time how wonderfully the thoughts of mortal men and women are mirrored upon the atmosphere of the astral plane, and as pictures they can be read and answered by spirits possessing the knowledge of how to read them. All spirits do not have the power, just as all men and women on earth are not able to read a newspaper or a letter. It requires intellect and education with us, as with those on earth. The spirits of these kind, men should be most beware of, are not so much the poor ignorant half-developed spirits of the earth plane and lower spheres, whose degraded lives have made them what they are and who are often glad of a helping hand to raise them, but it is of the intellectually evil, those who have great powers alike of mind and body, and who have only used them for wrong purposes. These are the real dangers to guard against, and it is only by the increase of knowledge amongst the mediums incarnated in the earthly body that it will be successfully done because then mortals and spirit workers will labor in unison, and mutually protect the spiritual movement from fraud and from the mistakes of the well-meaning but half-ignorant spirits and mortals who are doing good work in directing the attention of mankind to matter, but who often do harm both to themselves and others. They are like ignorant chemists and liable to bring destruction and harm upon others as well as on themselves, in their experiments in the search of knowledge. You do not think that the purity of their motives will suffice to protect them? Would purity of motive save a child from being burnt, if it thrust its hands into a blazing furnace? No. Then the only way is to keep the child as far from the fire as possible. This good and wise spirit guardians do in a great measure, but if the children are continually hovering near the danger, 
and try at all sorts of odd times and fashions to get just another peep at the dangerous thing, it is impossible, but some of them will get scorched. Then you would not advise the instinctively cultivation of mediumistic powers by all mortals? Certainly not. I would have all men use the powers of those who have been carefully developed under wise guardians, and I would have all assisted to cultivate them who are truly anxious to develop their powers as a means of doing good to others. But when you consider how many and how selfish they may be, and weight the motives are of those mediumistically endowed, you will see how exceedingly difficult it would be to protect them. Perhaps my ideas are colored by the circumstances of race and my earthly education, but I confess I would wish to limit the practice of mediumship to those who have proved their readiness to give up more material advantages for its sake. I would, in fact, rather see them set apart, as a body who have no share in the ambitions of mankind. But enough of our discussion. I am now about to let this astral shell go and draw your attention to another type of the same class. As he spoke he made a swift upward motion with his hands over it and uttered some words in an unknown language, whereupon the astral, which had floated on beside us, stopped and seemed to waver about for a few seconds until an advancing current of magnetism caught it, and it was swept away from us like a piece of driftwood upon the waves. As I turned from watching it I saw a small cluster of dark, weird, horrible-looking forms approaching us. These were astral shells that had never known soul life, but, unlike the pleasant waxy-looking astral from which we had just parted, these were in all respects repulsive. Hussain said, these are the emanations thrown off by men and women of a low intellectual type and evil, sensual lives. They are from the slums of the earth life, not only the social slums, but also from a higher grade of society where there are moral slums quite as degraded. Such beings as these, when animated by an evil intelligence, can be used for the very worst purposes. Being so very material, they can even be used to affect material matter upon earth, and have been used in the practice of what is known as black magic and witchcraft, and they are also used by higher intelligences to affect physical phenomena at seances. Where wise and good intelligences tell them no harm will be done, but under the direction of the evil or ignorant they become a danger beyond my power fully to express. To these astrals, and to those of a similar class in which the soul germ still lingers as in a prison, are due to those rough and dangerous manifestations, sometimes seen in spirit circles, where men of bad lives, and others too ignorant to protect themselves, are assembled from motives of curiosity or mere amusement. And amongst what class of spirits do you place those ghouls and vampires so firmly believed in, in many parts of the world? Vampire spirits are those who have themselves, known earth life, but have so misused it that their souls are still imprisoned in the astral envelope. Their object in sucking away the animal life principle of men and women in order to retain their hold upon the life of the earth plane, and so save themselves from sinking to far lower spheres. They are anxious to cling to their astral body and to prolong its life, just as men of very evil lives upon the earth cling to the life of the earthly body because they fear that when they are separated from it they will sink into some unknown depths of darkness and horror. The constant renewal of the animal and astral life often enables these vampire spirits to hang about the earth for centuries. Is it possible for a vampire spirit to possess for itself a sufficient amount of materiality to appear in mortal form and mingle with man as described in many of the tales told of such creatures? If you mean to ask if the vampire can make itself a material body, I say no, but it can and does sometimes take complete possession of one belonging to a mortal, just as other spirits do and can cause its acquired body to act in accordance with its will. Then it is quite possible for a vampire spirit clothed in the mortal body of another to change its expression to make it bear some resemblance to the vampire's own former earthly appearance, and through the power obtained by the possession of a material body he or she, because the vampires are of both sexes and might really lead the curious double life described to them in those weird tales current and believed in, in many countries. By far the larger number of vampire spirits are not in possession of an earthly body, and they hover about the earth in their own astral body, sucking away the earthly life of mediumistic persons, whose peculiar organization makes them liable to become the prey of such influences, while they are themselves quite ignorant that such beings as these astrals exist. The poor mortals suffer from a constant sense of exhaustion and lethargy, without suspecting what it is to be attributed to but cannot spirit guardians protect mortals from these beings? Not always. In a great measure they do protect them, but only as one may protect a person from infectious fevers, by showing them the danger and warning them to avoid spots where the vampire spirits are especially attracted to, 
owing it to the associations with their earthly lives. The guardian spirit does this by instilling into the mind of the mortal an instinctive dread of the places where crimes have been committed, or to evil persons of lives that have lived. But since man is and must be in all respects a free agent, it is not possible to do more. He cannot be directed in all things like a puppet, and must, in a great measure gather his own experience for himself, no matter how bitter its fruits may prove. Knowledge, guidance and help will always be given, but only in such a manner as will not interfere with man's free will, and only such knowledge as he himself desires, nothing will ever be forced upon him by the spirit world. I would have liked to ask Hussain a great many more questions about the astral plane and its many curious forms of life, but we were now fast leaving it behind, and passing downwards through those lower spheres which I had partly explored before. We were travelling through space at a wonderful velocity, not quite with the rapidity of thought but at a speed difficult for the mortal mind to conceive. Onward and still onward we swept, sinking ever lower and lower away from the bright spheres, and as we sank a certain sense of awe and expectancy crept over our souls and hushed our talk. We seemed to feel, in advance, the horrors of that awful land and the sorrows of its inhabitants. And now I looked far off at great masses of inky black smoke, which seemed to hang like a pall of gloom over the land to which we were approaching. As we still floated on and down, these great black clouds became tinged with lurid sulfurous-looking flames as from myriads of gigantic volcanoes. The air was so oppressive we could scarcely breathe, while a sense of exhaustion, such as I had never experienced before, seemed to paralyze my every limb. At last our leader gave the order for us to halt, and we descended on the top of a great black mountain which seemed to stick out into a lake of ink, and from which we saw on the horizon that awful lurid country. Here we were to rest for a time, and here, too, we were to part from our friends who had so far escorted us on our journey. After a simple feast consisting of various sustaining spiritual fruits and food which we had brought with us, our leader, on behalf of the whole company, offered up a short prayer for protection and strength, and then we all lay down upon the bleak mountain top to rest.